What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. I'm also a certified empowerment coach and also the owner and president of Express Your Vibe Coaching and Communications. And as always, I like to say you're blessed and highly favored. You're a magnet for miracles and you're a solution for someone's problem. Hope you're having a terrific Thursday. Whether you're watching this live or on replay, that is up to you. But I'm just happy that you're taking the time. And I'm always looking and searching and passionate about getting new faces, new hearts on the Dr. Vibe. I like to say conversation, though people say it's a show conversation. And a number of weeks back, uh, I was looking at the Good Men Project. And for those who don't know about the Good Men Project, it's one of the most viewed sites in the world for men. I've been a contributor audio wise for about two, two and a half years. And I, I'm the only show that is a contributor of the on their site on a regular basis. So most Tuesdays at 2.30, you'll see a Dr. Vibe conversation come up. But I was looking on the site and I saw this a very interesting article called Language that could fry bacon. Watch your mouth. I'm going, I'm a foodie, but this is a different type of foodie. <laughs> so I said to myself, let me reach out to this young man and see if he'd like to come on the conversation piece and uh, and share about a little bit of himself and about the subject, which is about the N-word. So we're going to have a conversation with the N-word also. And I just want to shout out to Danny Redwine. Thanks for joining the conversation. And if you have any comments, you can always just jump in or you can type in. So I said, Salik Ruffin, I want to know a little about you. I want to know what's going on. I want to know how you got involved in this. So we are blessed and highly favored to have Salik Ruffin on. Uh, you know what? I could read his bio, but I like people defining their own narrative. So Salik, first of all, thanks for coming on the conversation. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. A little bit about myself. I've... Uh... I have pretty extensive background of writing. So I, I originally started writing raps. I was a rapper at one time. And then um, I just got a little old for rapping. And, the, <laughs> and yeah, I got a little old for rapping. So I started writing more um, of my thoughts into just writing and, and, and the views that I had on things that was going on in today's society. So I started writing. Then I, 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 I had a job for a company and I met, um, I met an editor in the store. And this editor introduced me to another editor of Goodman Project. This was probably two years ago. And from there, um, okay. here I am on the Dr. Vibe show with you. And, and right. Well, you know, that you're being. You're, that's a very edited version about yourself. So I'm going to dig down a little bit deeper on that because there's more to you than just that little short little thumbnail. So when you don't take advantage of an opportunity, I'm here to big you up. So let's go a little further back. Where okay, were you born? okay. At I was born and raised in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts, Roxbury to be exact. And um, so now okay. I came out to, 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 to the uh, DMV area. You know, my wife got a promotion with her company. And we came out here, and now here I am. So here we are. And at the time, we weren't married. We came out here in 2009, got married in 2010. And so I said, well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, then writing was just an outlet for me to kind of continue my writing. That I was writing with raps, rhymes, that I just felt I got a little bit too grown up for. So I just transitioned that that uh, energy <laughs> into writing now. And thanks to you, you know, you saw the, one of the uh, the articles that I wrote and here I am and I'm ready to talk about that because that type of language can fry bacon. <laughs> there you go. I, I love the paraphrase, the phrase you use, frying bacon. How did you get involved writing for writing rap music? What, inside you made you to start doing well, that? Originally, um, Run DMC gave me my first inspiration. Um, I heard a Run DMC song, Suck MCs, you know, and, and I was like, wow, that's, that's nice, that's nice, I could do that. So I started writing words in places of their words, and I just started out with a rap. And so, you know, I used to go out on, on, in the neighborhood and, and, 
you know, recited, and people were like, wow, man, wow, what's that? Hey, yeah, hey, that's you? And from there, I started doing it, and I did it a little bit more, and never blossomed into a career, but it still was a, a huge passion of mine, it still is, and it's just transcended into writing that I do now, mostly for the good men. Okay, the writing that you do now, what are some, what are the subjects you are passionate when it comes to writing about? Um, passionate subjects to me are, well, just like the uh, the website promotes and advocates, you know, conversations about men by men. So I, I pretty much will just kind of write something that I would actually see. I would view my opinion. I just give my opinion on how a man would see something, certain issues that might be happening in society. Just like uh, the, uh, the actual, the article that you got me on the show about language that could fry bacon. You know, a lot of our youth, I mean, even I was guilty of this as well. When I came up, strong use of the word. I mean, I did it in my music and everything. And at one point in time, there were some friends of mine that uh, we had come up with a, a little game. So every time somebody would use that N word, we we would punch on them until they would say "proud black man," you know. And it didn't mm -hmm. catch nationally, but those friends of mine who started that moved to the West Coast. They moved to uh, to, to Oakland, and it it kind of migrated over there. So they took that game, and it's kind of huge over there, and it's carrying on in in, in a positive way over there. So then language that could fry bacon is an idiom that you know i heard a while back and i just kind of used it to kind of write to use it as the foundation to make that statement on and that that whole article that whole presentation so let let's talk about the use of the n-word now you used to write with with hip-hop rap etc did you use the N word in that in that context? And when you were using it in that context, how did you feel about uh, using it? I used it in 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 my music. I used it in daily use. I mean, I, I just used it because I felt I didn't feel any way any different. Uh, it didn't sway me one way or the next because I heard it so much. It was just used so much coming around me, um, growing up in the growing up in the hood, as you could say. You know, you just would hear it. And so it, the music that I was into, which was the rap music, it was more in there. So I would write rhymes and that would be the word that would be most used to, uh, you know, define us. But then after coming up of age and then being introduced to like, hey, that's kind of not right. It's like, wow, really? So I started looking into it more and that was probably in my, um, late teens you know somebody came up and said hey that's not like you know you don't want to necessarily keep using that and at the time i was like why not like because it, it was a black man who approached me about it and then i found that odd like why is this brother telling me not to use this word that's supposed to be our word then so i i went along and did more research to it and and actually, probably 20 years ago, uh, I wrote this exact, this exact um, article. It was not verbatim, not word like this, but it was, it was, it was, it was the N word. It was the word itself. It was called blank syndrome, um, and it basically that's where I drew all of this from. Anyway, I kind of wanted to revisit that time and place that I was within myself at that point in time and bring that back because this word was, you know, coming back into, into our lives, man, like, like crazy. And a lot of, a lot of the youth now, a lot of people now just don't know and understand the, the origin of the word. And then not just the origin of the word, but more of the impact of that word and how that word makes the person using the word feel and makes the person that it's used against feel. 
and then making the people feel around who's hearing it feel like it's got like so much power to it not even a good power but it's got so much power that people who use their power need to know and understand the power that you have so i wanted to to bring revisit that whole thing that i had 20 some years ago and i'm so i'm bringing back the light now that that i got like I'm writing now and people are reading my writing and I got a voice now, another voice. Before it was a voice of, of, of rap and, and the word was used and it was it was accepted because it was told to us that, yeah, that's the word, it's good. It was even in, 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 in the article that I have, I say when I used it, I put the A on the end as opposed to the ER. And, and, and I, in retrospect, I think, putting the A on the end made me feel a little better by using it. Not the same because it didn't have the ER on the end. Um, that's what I thought. It's really the same word. It's just, it's just, you know, dialect. <laughs> and that's pretty much, you know, that's all it is. Yep. It's the same word. So I want people to know it's the same word. You using the same word, you doing the same damage. Well, you know what? There are so you gave such a wonderful sharing point right now in the fact that there's so many different areas that we're going to get into in this conversation. Again, I want to shout out anyone who's in the conversation right now. If you have any questions for Salik about the article or if you have any comments about the N word, would love to get your participation, whether it's on the side in the chat or jumping on in the screen yourself. So, Lee, do you remember now you talked about the moment that this older gentleman came to you and sort of confronted you about using the N word? Do you, how much do you remember that conversation? If you remember any of it, can you share any, um, any of it with I us? I can share it. I don't remember it um, as much as how it really went and what the words meant, but it was right. pretty much like he came and he, he, he was. Um, he actually was an old guy who, who I, I, I looked up to, and, and he actually looked up to me too. That's why he was kind of. That's why at first he came to me and said, "We need to stop using that word, bro." And I said, "Well, why?" I didn't understand why. Why is he asking me to not, you know, call myself or the people I'm with this word, you know and. and but because I had that respect for this man, you know, I, I, I listened to him and I went on and I, I researched it a little bit more and kind of studied up on it and, and drew my own understanding of it. And it was like, wow, he's kind of right. This is a word that's not necessarily what, what we should be throwing back and forth this way. And I did limit the word at the time, but I... I'm not gonna lie, I still did use it every now and then. And uh, it 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 was like it was like trying to quit cigarettes, I guess. You know, it, like you may uh it, I couldn't go cold turkey. I just, you know, I just would limit it, limit it. Almost really little, but I would still, you know, get with my friends because they were still doing it. You know, and you know, when we're younger, nobody's really listening to the positive things that are being said, you know, we didn't want to hear all that. And so it was a little bit more difficult at that time back then to kind of make a positive stance and be heard. But now, you know, it, positivity is, is, it's cool now. So I'm taking the advantage to let people know what's good and what's bad because it's cool to listen now. Enough. I'm just going to, uh, Give some commentary here. Cat Kathy Crowley eight said we used to say Negro back in the day, and at that time it was politically correct. And then she said I was never allowed to use the N word, and that's very interesting. I wonder how many households of non-black mm. were, were said no, we're not allowed to use the N word. So that is interesting. Um, that Danny Redwine saying, I have used it on stage during my sets, but I'm more conscious of using it. One of my goals is to not slip up. So you still use it, Danny? Interesting. 
All right. So uh, you can certainly join in the conversation. Shout out to Ricardo McRae. We're having a good conversation here with Salik Ruffian, who's just recently written an article about the N word in the Good Men at the Good Men Project. I'll put up the link in, in a little bit on the side. So, Salik, what sort of research did you do about the history behind the N word, and um, what did you find out? I, I, I've read books. I uh, I heard it a lot because um, I also do stand up comedy. So a lot of my favorite comedians use it all the time. One of my favorite ones who did use it all the time was Richard Pryor. Um, he used it a lot. Um, who else? I mean, almost all of them, almost every black person that I knew and do know now used it and still use it. Um, so I did research that way. I kind of looked into you know why they would use it and what they had to say about when they used it. Uh, I I went to the library, you know, this was long before internet. So I was actually in a building that had millions of books. <laughs> and I, they did have a computer though. You know, you had to look through that computer to find the book you were looking for. So at that time I looked through a lot of books and um, I, 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 I studied things that, that that older gentleman had had shown me. What uh, where I could find more information on it. So I found a lot of information actually from him, and then I found a lot of information in um in a lot of the teachings in in, in the five percent nation, a lot of the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. So I found a lot in in I, I read um you know message to the black man. I've read Malcolm X's books. I've read and even Malcolm X living in Boston at one time, you know, that gave me more, more of an inspiration to kind of find out better ways to kind of conversate and, and, and define myself that way or define my friends that way, you know, and because the one thing that I kind of carried from it was that older gentleman had said to me, he was like, well, you know, did you ever look at the people around you when you ever say those words? And and I didn't at first, then I started to. And then that's how I kind of pointed to the next person nowadays. I say, you ever look at the face of whether it's black or white people, yeah. that'll be in earshot when you say the word. You know, nine times out of 10, it's a, it's a, it's a look of disgust just to hear it and just to see where it's being said from. You know, and so, um, I wanted to not, you know, cause that that feeling amongst people hearing me talk. So I took that step at this time to uh to kind of limit it in my vocabulary. So I looked in the library, looked in books, looked in um well lots of books. And then that those books led me to, and this was back when um Encyclopedias was still around. You know, you remember encyclopedias? <laughs> oh yeah, well, oh yeah, encyclopedias yeah. as well. So I would look and I would see where it was, and I would look in the dictionary as well. You know, and I would see the definition of the word and the definition of different adjectives. You know, such as like black or definition of white. You know, black being like bad, white being like pure. You know, and then looking at the definition and kind of dissecting that and saying, wow, like really? And then kind of, you know, expounding off of that. And so the dictionary, you know, is, is a very good tool, still is, has been, and it always will be. I'm talking about the hard book with pages you flip through and you looking under W, you looking under C, and you looking through a book as opposed to just going on the internet and hitting under Google you know, seeing what somebody posted or seeing what somebody is giving to you as the definition of whatever it might be that you're looking for. Now, I ran off on a tangent, but... So, that's okay. No, it's okay. I, it's it, There's a lot of good conversation going on, on the side, so I'm just going to share it with you, and, and we'll go in and out about your article, but certainly there's a lot of a lot of commentary here. Um, Danny Redwine is saying she's working on using the N-word less and less. 
uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy Crowley is saying, of course, my black friends use it for fun. Um, Danny Redwan is saying it's easy. It's easier to use it in urban all black venues, not so much mainstream. Uh, interesting with Kathy Crowley growing up in rural Texas, she was not allowed to use that word. And a lot of people say, well, in rural Texas, they probably have no problem using that word. But that's very interesting there. We also have Danny Redwine saying, I think the biggest challenge is to exercise what we were all taught, quote, think before you speak. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in, she says, also says, especially in comedy, improv is huge on stage. Ricardo McRae is saying, I don't understand why black people are always fighting to keep saying the N-word that was designed to subjugate and kill them. Mm -hmm. And Kathy Crowley saying, if you can't say something nice, keep your mm -hmm. mouth zipped. And then another, well, there's a great conversation going on here. I want you to respond to some of this stuff. Also, Danny Redwine is saying, it's always used as an endearment, but right. is it? Good question. So let's take some of these co these conversation pieces uh, and have you share about them. Uh, for example, what are your thoughts about the word and word being used in music in comedy where do you stand because you came from an environment where you used it in music i do and i guess even before do you still use it now at any time um even though i have like if you read the article the piece i wrote it will say that i started writing the article kind of pointing fingers at people still using the word in in, in every now and then yes i have and still the word will come out of my mouth. Um, and well, so before you go any further, when it comes out of your mouth, how uh, do you I feel? I feel like just reaching out to the air and pulling it back. <laughs> Even though I know I can't, but, and that's how I feel. But then on, on the flip side of that feeling, I also feel like if, if, if and when it does happen to um, come out, it's always around someone who's, all right and okay with it. Like they're probably uh, lightly or strongly using it as well. But but the uh, but here's the point: you're okay with it, but are um, you really okay with it? Right. Yeah, I'm not. It, that's why if I could reach out and grab the words, I would. Uh, or I just I'd rather not just even have to feel like reaching out and grabbing them. I, I work more of limiting it uh, a lot more now than ever because just it, that's how that feeling just you know wanting to reach out and grab the words back you know I can't so that feeling when I feel like I want to do something that I know I can't I don't like that feeling so I curb the use right. of it more more so than ever actually. You know, and, and I, I respect that because when you use it, you it hits you right, emotionally. Right. So, you know, and we're, n we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. But at least there's a feeling that comes to you when you use it saying, oh, I wish I could snag it back. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a point here, Ricardo McKay saying it's like being in an abusive relationship and your partner hits you, then you then says, sorry, I love you. It's not love. It's abuse. What are your thoughts on that? Using the word is it? It's is it abusive to use that um, language? It, it, that it, it really sort of is abusive. Yes, because um, it's like I said earlier. It's a powerful word, and it, it creates emotions that that sometimes can go uncontrolled and within the person that's using it and the person hearing it, and it can be it can be damage in both ways it's like it's like having a conversation and like like i one um analogy i used to always use and i still do is you call a cat a dog long enough and he'll start to bark um and that's where the the comfortableness of the n-word the uses of that word came from like you call a cat, a dog, long enough, he's going to bark. You call a person 
inward long enough, they're going to take that word and turn and, 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 and wear it proudly, not knowing the, the history or the origin of it. They think, okay, well, I've been hearing this all forever. It's got to be some truth in it or some right in it. And then that's where, you know, me as an individual who has the voice now to kind of put it in paper and let people hear it, and read it. I'm doing what I can do to kind of get back to that space I was at where I did not use it as much or at all. Excellent. Just want to say a shout out to Brian Lobig. Thanks so much to uh, have you come on for a second. We're having a conversation uh, with Salik Ruffin about an article he's written on the Good Men Project called Language That Could Fry Bacon, Watch Your Mouth. And specifically, we're talking about the use of the N-word. So if anyone has any, com there's been lots of commentary going on on the side here and really appreciate it. And we're making a we're making Salik work tonight. So, and it's not, I just providing the platform, but he, he's being very responsive, being very transparent and being very honest about this subject. And if anyone would like to jump in and to take a seat, more than welcome to add to the richness of this conversation. Uh, and Kathy Crowley says she loves the title of the article. Well, thanks, Kathy. Good stuff. Good stuff. Why, why do you feel, especially in the entertainment world, the N-word is still used so much? Um, well, because whether it's in the entertainment world or outside of the entertainment world, that word has been, just like I said, you call a cat a dog long enough, the cat will begin to bark. So everywhere in whatever black people are doing when we're um, so-called keeping it real or being uh, who I am straight from the hood, this is what it is, you know, it's more, it, it, it's, we're, we're more relaxed. So when we talk, we continue to talk relaxed with that tone or that subject matter or that word. So when we do, um, the entertainment, we do comedy, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's the only form of expression that, that a lot of entertainers have, you know, um, they can be, um, the, 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 they could have the largest vocabulary in the world. That one word still, they can't replace it with anything else. They don't know what to. So the comedy or the, 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 the music, the raps, the rhymes, or the, the movies even still reflect that, that, that um, incapableness of replacing that word, even though we have plenty more words in a whole larger vocabulary these days than we ever have, but we still gravitate to that one word. So when you, you come to know and understand that and, and you can control it a little bit more. See, you have to, I, I think what it is, is you have to start to look, you can't, you can't, um, you can't fix the problem until you know what the problem is. And when I said what you know what the problem is, the basis of the problem, the foundation of the problem. Like you can, you can, you can look at your, if you got a cut, you can look at the scab and say, oh, I had a cut. That cut came from uh, maybe a, a, a way you was traveling to to and from somewhere, and you had to go a certain way, and you would cut your arm every now and then. So if you know that's where the cut comes from, you'll stop going that route. You won't get the cut no more. You won't look at the scab and say, well, I'm not going to get the cut no more, but you're still continuing that route and cut right over the scab again. But if you stop taking the route, then you don't get the scab no and the scab is healed, it goes away, problem solved. So until we get to the root of these problems, we can't really change the problem. We might know what the problem is, but if we don't know what the root of that problem is, it's always gonna be a problem. 
Ricardo McRae is added here. It's post-traumatic slave syndrome. It's in out in it's in out brain and thoughts, and we're keeping ourselves enslaved by using the word. And, and it's one of those things, and, and and I definitely hear you out, Ricardo, in regards to that. Are right, correct? That it's one of the things we know it's not right, but we're still doing it. What's what is the blocker? <laughs> In, in regards to why we're still, well, there, there's, I guess, a debate in itself, and it goes ongoing whether the use of the word is right or wrong in itself, and that's even amongst blacks themselves. But when you have conversations about this topic with other blacks or pe other people, people who are of your color and not your color, what sort of reaction are you getting? Uh, well, the reaction that I get, if I'm, see, I, I've rarely ever had a conversation with someone about it that is of another race uh, because okay. there's really never, unless of course I might hear them use it, but there's never any, any, any segue into that conversation. We're probably talking, I may be at work with them, we're just doing work, it doesn't come out, so we don't talk about it. And I'm not saying they don't use it outside of work or when I'm not around, probably do, I'm pretty sure. 99% positive. But that's that's another that's another show and another title. <laughs> but um so when I talk with, yeah. with 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 people my people, people of color, my black people, um I mention it and I say, you know, because even even just as, as uh recent as yesterday, um because I had mentioned at the end of this article that um that that proud black man game we used to play when we were younger i mentioned that in the paper at the end of the paper at the end of the article and um one of the um one of my friends who who started the game who lives in california now he read the paper he read it and was like wow you know you you, you mentioned you mentioned the game when you hit start you know and i was like yeah it didn't really catch on globally but I, I, yeah, I mean, I haven't forgotten about it because it's still, it's still relevant. It's still something that needs to be put in practice. And he was telling me that they still do it um, where they are in Oakland, and and he was he was he was happy that uh that I I mentioned him and the I didn't mention him by name, but I mentioned my friends and the game we used to play. And how it went, you know, if somebody said the N-word, we would kind of hit on them until they said proud black man. And that was a way that we kind of encouraged to not use it. And and that was we were probably like late teenagers, 1918. And um and we, we didn't see that anywhere else. We just they just started up and we just kind of went on with it and they took it out to the West coast and that's where they're doing it now. You know, maybe one day in the future it'll catch on globally and people will stop, you know, limiting their ways and using it and reacting with the, uh, the game and causing them to use, replace it with maybe something a lot shorter than proud black man. And that's probably why it's not catching on as, as as fire as we would like it to. We we like shortcuts, right. you know. We we we're lazy, you know. We are. Even though we have <laughs> jobs, even though we go out and, and get for ourselves, we're still lazy. So we like and and, and that has a lot to do with technology. I mean, you know, you you we, we don't want to wait for the uh, the old conventional oven to cook for an hour to make us some meat. So we're popping in the microwave and getting in ten minutes. That's lazy. We 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 don't want to we don't want to walk over to see our friend. We'd rather type on the computer and say, "Hey, what's going on?" or send them a text message on their phone as opposed to going and seeing them having a live conversation. We don't talk anymore because we're too lazy to do that. We don't want to. So we're too lazy to, to use that long 
proud black men in place of it. So we, I think that if I thought of something shorter, that'll be a, a, a replacement of the N word and that might take a little bit more kindly and people will, will, you know, would like to use it and play the game a little bit more, be a little more serious with it. Then it wouldn't even have to become a game. It would just drop out of vocabularies. Let me ask, how much does using of the N word, blocks using of the N using of the N word have to do with self respect? Um a lot. I would say eighty five percent of the use of it has to do with self respect. I would say self respect for the individual using it and for the individual they're using it towards. Because um the, the kind of conversation that you would carry on with a person is because of the respect you hold for them. Just like if you're on an interview, for a job interview, you're not going to talk to the interviewer like you would talk to the guy you just left at the corner of the bus stop when you was waiting and you said, oh, yeah, I remember you from school. Yeah, yeah that conversation is going to be different than the one you have with the interviewer because there's a level of respect you hold for that interviewer that you do not hold for that person who you know personally and probably have emotional ties to. But you feel more comfortable disrespecting him because you disrespect yourself using the word on yourself. So it's no problem saying to him, but you know it can be a problem if you say certain things to the interviewer. So you don't want to go, you don't want that problem. But the problem with the next man is easy to, you can like either look at him some certain way or show him some certain thing and that problem goes away. But because the interviewer, that is a whole nother problem that we don't even want to get into because we <laughs> you know what you're doing? You're setting yourself up for more conversations on here. You know that. You're set, and I, I hope you can come on more because there's a lot of important, relevant subjects yes. that you've brought up in your sharing tonight that need to can we're gonna continue the conversation, will, obviously. This is just this is just the beginning. This is the beginning of a long lasting relationship. Absolutely. I'll be welcome. i welcome to be back on Thank the show you. with whatever topic and you know and come up with any offshoots from tonight's conversation we'll do that because you know, all the comments over here thank you these are all subjects all these comments are like subjects in their own so we can make other shows we we do we, we this is nothing we can do this we, well, no we, not we can we will that is good. not we can I, I I have been, and uh, individuals like Ricardo are now have, have been for a while. So you're not alone. We are doing this. It's not something we will. We are. It's a it's an R. So, what do you feel it's going to take to stop using this N word? Because you had a perfect example many years ago. An elder came to you, and for lack of a better word, confronted you and saying, you know what, this isn't right. And it changed your thought process. You began to research and it's changed you. What does it, what will it take for, especially younger blacks, or no, you know what, blacks in general who use the word to stop, what are the, some of the things you think it need, will need to take to stop that use well, of the N-word? One, one thing I'd say who would help to stop the use of it is to have more, more, uh, positive um, people we can look up to, we can respect, you know, cause, cause the youth today don't listen to you unless they respect you. They respect in one or of two ways. They respect you if you, if you seem educated about whatever it may be maybe street education or some book education that you bring to them. So they respect you that way or they respect you in a fearful way. In only two ways. 
So we have to, as individuals, have to find out how can we gain that respect of the youth and then we can go to the youth and say, listen, this is what I want to see done or this is what I want to see changed because it's going to benefit you and me. Then by benefiting you and me, it's going to benefit us as a whole and everyone who comes in after us or who have come before us. So when we kind of figure out how we can just be that that positive image, you know, um, I've always been told, you know, uh, a true leader leads by example. You know, he don't say, hey, this is what we want. And then he lead by example. So if he's not doing it, nobody's going to try to be like him and do what he's not doing, but he's talking about doing. If you're doing it, then you're more likely to get the followers or, or, or the people behind you to do it as well. That's how I think we'll get that change. That's why I'm limiting it, the use of it a whole lot more. I've, I, I've honestly, I've cut it out of my vocabulary about 92%. You got your numbers down. Because um, <laughs> I'm working on having it totally out, 100%. So I know I know the it's not much more work I need to do to kind of extract it out of my vocabulary completely. It's not. So I say 92%. It's not an actual fraction. Go ahead. You're going to say something? Yeah, yeah, just with you taking it out of your vocabulary, taking the N word out of your vocabulary, how have people have people noticed that change in you? Um, people, I would I would say they have, but um, people are not so used to kind of uh, reacting verbally or vocally to change. So they don't kind of say, yeah, I noticed this or, hey, you know, that doesn't happen with. OK, we're back on. Sorry for the technical challenge. It was out of our hands, folks. But uh, yes, I just wanted to also just say we're going to be on for probably recording wise for about another 15 minutes. So if anyone would like to jump in and uh, provide any comments, would absolutely appreciate it. we got about 15 minutes left. I see Ricardo, you're on here. Uh, I see, I think buyblocks.com has jumped in. But uh, if you have any comments, please come on in and join the conversation. Michael, come on in if you want to join the conversation. We've got about 15 minutes left. We're talking about the use of the N-word with Salik Ruffin. So uh, continue where you left off, Salik. Um, I can't. I don't even remember. It was just... No, no, we, we, no we're, just, we're talking about uh, what things can be done Okay, okay. Yeah. To stop using the N-word. Also, big shout out to Sisterhood Ex Expo. Thanks for jumping in. If you have any comments on what can be done for block for blocks to stop using the N-word. So continue on, Salik. Okay. Um, well, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> um, I was I was saying what, what could be done is we need more um, positive role models, not just positive role models, we need positive images. Um, because the youth today, they only respect one or two things. They respect the fear or they respect the, the knowledge, the education of something, something. They just want, they respect an individual who knows something that they don't, or even that they do know, but they just need to know a little bit more of. So they respect that. So if 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 we come in that position of, of knowing more or, or or demanding more respect from these young people, then we'd be able to approach them and say, "Listen, you, uh, I'd like for you to hey, I'd like for you to kind of curb that that the usage of that word because and and." And I've always been told you can't leave someone with a void 
without feeling that boy. So you say, well, right. I want to take this out of your vocabulary. I'll give you this to say. Um, because if you leave them with nothing, then they're they bound to go crazy. And it could get just uglier. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. Hey, Ricardo, what is up? Can't hear you. Hey, can't hear you, Ricardo. Uh, I, there we go. Okay, we can hear you. Uh, can, can hear you now. Let me just switch it to a different headset. Yeah. That one doesn't work. I should throw it out. What about now? Yep. Awesome. Great. Good. Awesome. You're good. You're good. Thanks for stopping by. I'm going to have to start calling you the king of blab. No, man. I'm loving blab. This is, this is, <laughs> this is my new home. I'm loving it that you you get take time to jump on my conversations and I reciprocate as much yeah. as I can. We we both I love what you're doing and whenever I can I jump in. Right back at it. And I know this is something that you're very passionate about, so I appreciate no, I know this is part of your core and my core, so yeah. I appreciate you jumping in. What would you have to share with what Salik has said tonight? Salik, first of all, congratulations on writing that article, man, and taking on this subject and taking on something that uh, you could quite potentially get a lot of flack for and pushback from the community that you're actually trying to make a difference in. So yeah. I just want to tell you, you know, from one brother to the next, I appreciate you standing up because thank you. Thank it you. will be pushback. People love that word. Is <laughs> it trying to take fried chicken away from people? It's going to be a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Good take. Good take. So it's it's for me. It's. It's, it's not in my vocabulary. I, I grew up in Trinidad in the Caribbean. I uh, came to Canada when I was 18. And you know, for the first time I heard that word being used uh, to refer to, to the people that look and, and like me. And I was like, remember the first time I was like walking on the street and someone used that word towards me. And I was just like, it was like this other universe. I'm like, wow, what just happened there? Mm. And, uh, you know, I know it's a very, very, common phrase and word in American culture to, you know, end this and that and I add an extra A on the end and, you know, I'm going to take one letter out and switch it around. And mm -hmm. I, my belief is, is that words create everything in the world. Nothing can be created without language. Like you don't even know that you're depressed until somebody gives you that word called depressed. Other than that, you're just kind of like, I might be moody. But once you understand what the word depressed is, you can say, you know what, I actually am depressed. And then you can start actually moving towards things to fix that. Mm -hmm. So you don't even know what overweight is until someone gives you that language. You're just eating whatever you want to eat and everybody's like this. So it becomes normalized. And just because something is normalized, just like being overweight, doesn't mean that it's good. 60% of people in America are overweight. It doesn't mean it's good. You get heart attacks, there's all sorts of ramifications because of that. Using that word to me is is worse than that. Is worse than being overweight. It's it's one of the most damaging things you can do to your mind, which is the most sacred place that we all have. Um, the mind controls everything about your life, where you're going, what you think about, wh what you believe you can become, who you love, who you like, all of it. And when you you put that word, you, you especially in America. It is, for me, this is my, my take, it is almost impossible to, to detach that from its origins of enslaving African peoples and the brutality and the, the, the viciousness with which we were attacked and continue to be attacked to this day. And based on numbers, it's even higher than it was back then. And for us to be using this word with each other as if it means nothing, as if it's, oh, I'm going to reappropriate the world. I'm like, no, 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 dog. There's a lot of words you could reappropriate. Rich is one you could reappropriate. Wealthy is one you could appropriate. Loving is a word. Don't, don't pick this one. This one, not about removing it from the English language, but we have to understand it is incredibly powerful. And when we say it to each other, I, I was thinking about this today. I'm like, how do we begin to explain to someone just how damaging this is? And I'm like, I have a little baby, he's five months old, and he re doesn't understand words, but he understands energy. Like if somebody's just a closed off person and they pick him up, he starts to cry immediately. But if somebody's loving and warm and 
He's like, hey, he's giving them hugs. He's all in there. And if we close our eyes and we say that N word over and over, and you say it to somebody that you love, say it to your grandmother's face, like picture that person that you love, your mom, and just say it to her face. Feel the vibration in your body. It is not, it is not positive. It is not loving. I don't care if you put an A on the end. You don't speak to your mama like that. You don't speak to your daddy like that. It's just not loving. And when you say something like, instead of looking at your grandma and using the N-word, now say the word queen. Say the word, grandma, you are incredible. Grandma, I love you. Grandma, you are an N. It's the opposite of it. And the energy of that word can't be, like, it's a very powerful thing. And it needs to be used, you know, very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to study and understand that so that more people really get the history of that and the significance of it and treat it with reverence and respect and use it very, very sparingly rather than everybody's just using it. Because I I, I'm married to a woman. She's white. And I'm like, I listen to hip hop. And I'm like, I have to stop because I can't take the lyrics of it. I've stopped listening to hip hop. Like, oh, I was like, I look online for hip hop that has all those N words out of it simply because how do I sit here and justify that word when I sit here with, with my wife who's white? Like, what if she starts singing that song? I'm like, that song ain't cool to sing to me. You can't use that word with me. And if it's not cool for you to use, God damn it, I need to be a little more careful with that. So I've never really used it in my mm -hmm. language, but I'm even understanding, as you say, it's 92% gone. But for me, I'm, I'm cleaning it out of what I'm doing to, to contribute is I'm taking it out of the music. I'm taking it out of my iPod. I'm taking it out of people can't use that word around me. I'm just like, yo, I'm, you're going to have to stop that. Or I, I will remove myself. I'm like, I am not going to be in a conversation where that's being used. And I apologize for the rant, but I get a little excited. For you. No, no, no. It's, you know, it, it's all good because and it's very important that, you know, personally, the last time saw, someone called me that was back in grade four. I can remember it vividly. Yeah. It was in grade six. It was the day of my Christmas, uh, the school Christmas party, our class Christmas party, and I beat the heck out of someone who called me that. Yeah. And for some reason, no one's ever called me that N word ever since. Don't know that why. Word trap. <laughs> that word got out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah. So but, we gonna dial that back on that, uh, Doctor Vibe. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you know, you said a very important word many important words there, Ricardo, but one of the ones that really sticked out with me is the energy mm -hmm. when that word is used. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, for me anyways, create good energy. Yeah. Words are energy. And, and when we use that word with each other, we say it lovingly, but I'm like, I, I made that reference earlier on to it being like an abusive relationship. It feels loving. Yeah just because everybody's doing it. Just like they were, at one point it was okay to hit your wife. Like it, 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 just because people are doing it doesn't make it okay. Just because a lot of people do it doesn't make it okay. It's still very wrong. They send a lot of people to gas chambers and that was legal. They're locking a lot of black men up and that's legal. It is not okay. I don't care if it's legal. I don't care if everybody's doing it. You in your heart know what's right and know what's wrong. And when I feel that word, I never feel loved, never. I, not, I don't care. Hey, yo, what's up? And I was like, yo, yo. I've stopped talking to people because of this. I'm like, they're like, yo, it's just what I want to use. I say, I understand that. Then we can't hang out. I'm not telling you to stop. I'm just saying I'm going to be responsible for myself. You know, uh, Salik is responsible himself. He's like, he's working and taking it out. We all have to take sort of personal responsibility. I have my lines. You have yours. Everybody needs to know where their lines are. And just for me, I'm just, I have a zero tolerance. <laughs> I'm just like, I, under no circumstances. Is that word to be used yeah, around I, in any context? I'm, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I, I don't care. That's that's just not part of my cat because when you call me that, you're calling my right. bloodlines that. And they didn't want to be called that. They fought not to be called like that. Why is it acceptable right. now? No, it, it just, no, that's just not right. And we're, we're better when than that. I think that. of uh, that woman who freed slaves and she walked from Mississippi to Canada. What was her name? Harriet Tubman. Right. Tubman. Yeah, now, Harriet I, Tubman. I sit down and think about this. I'm like, a flight from Toronto to Atlanta is, is like six hours in a plane. Yeah. Walking 
Right? Like, yeah. just type that into Google Map and see how long the walk is. Then add on top of that distance, having to hide along the way and carry people with you. Like, it took her, like, carry people. Now, imagine yeah. she took a month to go one way just because you have to hide and you got to, you know, only go so far every day. And then once she got to Canada, you know what she had to do? She had to go back and then do it again and walk up and then walk back and walk up. Let me ask you a question. Would you look at her and use that word? Mm -hmm. She didn't walk all that way so you could use that word. That is not why she was walking. That is not why. She was like, I could have freed more people if I could have proven to them that they were slaves. But they don't believe they're slaves. So they stayed where they were. Yeah. And it's like, we have to understand Absolutely. that we, slavery is psychological. It is not physical. The biggest piece of slavery is control of the mind. And if you control someone's mind, yeah. you can know, you know, you don't even need a shackle. And as a community, I don't think we've ever addressed the psychological impact of slavery on ourselves and how that gets passed on from one generation to the next. The same way uh, wealth and the principles of wealth could be passed on from Donald Trump to his son, to, you know, we can pass on the, the ideologies and the experiences of slavery from one generation to the next. So fundamentally, we are still uh, enslaved as people until we start doing the hard work to undo those knots in our head. And one of those things is the N-word, a huge one is the N-word, because we are doing it to ourselves. And I agree. And I, another important word you said there, it's going to take work. And are we willing to do the work? <laughs> that There's a big question. Are we willing to do the work? Mm -hmm. Because it's not going to disappear no. overnight. It's been a, around for no. hundreds, thousands of years. But are we willing to start doing work on it? Because if we don't... It'll be around for another thousand. Oh, I, my I, This is what I think of, man. I we were doing the blab yesterday. We got into the whole race and racism thing. And I was sitting here with my little son who's four months old and having a baby has me think of things like, you know, what is it that I want to push forward in the world? Cause he's the future. What do I yep. want? I did my life, you know, I'm 46 years old uh, and I'm halfway through my life and my experiences are my experiences, but they don't have to be his experiences. And what is it that I'm going to give him or what platform am I going to build so that he can, stand on that and then do something bigger and better than his daddy. And I'm like, like is that, is that tool still relevant for him to move forward in the world? If I were to use that word like that every day in my life. And I'm like, no, that is not a tool that has value. Just like a rotary phone no longer has value. We have to stop using those exactly. things. Like those are old ways of yeah. thinking. And we have to start looking at what are some more progressive ways that actually like, imagine you walked on the street and every brother that you saw said, what's up, King? How you doing, Black man? Hold your head high. Like, instead of the N-word. I love her. Yeah. How you doing, my brother? I, I got I to gotta tip my... And you know what's interesting? I remember growing up when I was with, with my parents and... Actually, you know what? And there's a gentleman who's on the show a lot and he hasn't written the article yet, but he wants to write an article about the head yeah, nod. Yeah, yeah. I have a question about you know, that. I remember, about head, like, and I don't know if it happens in the but states, I but I know it a lot in Canada, and I don't. But it doesn't happen as much anymore, where black men would be passing by each other and they just yeah. give the head nod, just like like yeah. that's like that's a what's up, brother? The no, head nod. Here's my question: to That what's the difference between this and this? <laughs> that's what I was. I was like, is it a hey? How you doing? Or like which one is the, I don't know. I always find the, the two interesting. It's like sometimes it's a head down and sometimes it's a head up. Leap, you, Leap, you haven't had a chance to jump in for a bit, and, and you're the guests tonight, so we want to we'll get some of your feedback too, okay. man. I, I don't know the difference of those, man. I know the difference. <laughs> I know the difference when I use it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this this that's more informal. Okay. That one. Little, little formal. Don't know what. Yeah. Maybe it's, yeah. that's that's a very good head observation. Nod. Yeah, I, I, it's just something nod. I noticed, and I was like, "There's an up and there's a down." And yeah, if just thinking, I'm just I, I have no idea what it means. So I'm just always like, I mean, I know to do it, and I do it, but I'm like, when do I do this, and when I do that? Like, you're absolutely right. This is a little more formal, 
and this is a little more like what's up man how you like someone my own age would get a yeah. heads up and a senior man yeah. would <laughs> <laughs> my bro but you you know what and it's That's interesting good. i like that if, i like that if, if it, especially for a younger black man if you're walking you see them would you get more of a reaction from them by saying the n word what's up n word rather than giving them the head nod i in turn please salute i don't i don't look for the reaction i'll always say hey how you doing okay. brother i'll always say that whether whether okay. i know the person mm. personally and i know that the use of that word is is they use it all the time i'm not looking for for how they're going to feel when i say hey, what's, what's going on bro you know i mean i would like for them to, to just say hey bro back or, or like cuz i got a um i i do stand up comedy as well um and one time i was telling this joke about being at um over my in-law um I was with my wife and we stayed over their house um and I was, I was I woke up in the morning and I was passing through the the hallway to the bathroom I see my wife's uncle who's my uncle now and I said hey good morning bro and he says what's up my inward and I was like <laughs> Good morning. And I was like, "What?" Dude, we went to the bathroom. I was like, "Calm down, you know." And, and, yeah, and that reaction I always get. I, so I, I, I used to tell that as sometimes part of common stand up when I would do it on stage, like tell that story because it was funny to me, but at the same time, it was, it was shocking. And mm-hmm. and I like to tell that story to kind of to 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 let people know and understand how it felt, how I felt, just hearing that you know, right and early in the morning from an older black man who I just thought, hey, uh, what? So <laughs> you know, and like you were saying, like I was saying the same thing, Ricardo, but you put it in in, in a more eloquent way and and the the energy um you know because actually that's that's a good thing that's um reminds me of of a of a of a saying that i years ago first saw a quote rather and it was watch your words they mm-hmm. become, watch your words they become um no watch your thoughts they become yeah. words watch your words they become your actions watch your actions mm-hmm. they become habits watch your habits it becomes your destiny and i was like you know it starts with a thought so and that thought is energy mm-hmm. and like you were saying you 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 kind of gave the analogy of of the baby you know um responding to the person being full of smiles and and joyful as opposed to they pick them up and they don't feel mm, the baby starts crying because of that energy because of that thought you know that 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 transference of the energy is, is mm-hmm. that's real mm-hmm. it is real or people don't know of it much to to believe it but that's real yeah that's another it's real. close your eyes and put your hands together like this it's like you can feel it it's it's real like energy is is absolutely real and you can oh i don't know it has to be scientifically proven i'm like listen you can't see oxygen but it's real <laughs> you exactly you don't it, need to see it to know it's real oh, yeah. you hold your throat for three seconds um, you'll be like oh no uh, miss it for a moment um, <laughs> i'm gonna jump out absolutely so people can come on in uh, uh i thanks again brother for stopping of by course, eh? man. of course always 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 much love Thank you, Salik, for writing the article. Much the fans, yeah, all right. Doing. Thank you. Well done. All right. God bless. Thanks for making the conversation better. Good stuff. Anyone else want to jump in? Right, uh, David has stayed a little bit longer than he said he was going to, so we appreciate that, but we don't want to take up his time. Askia, would you like to jump in or anybody else before we let uh, Salik jump off? And Salik, I'm going to be in touch with you to join 
in some other conversations. Askia, yes, Askia needs to jump in. Uh, but definitely I will be t- in touch with you offline because uh, if you want, I, I hold a number of different conversations and I'll certainly come on, everyone. Askia, we're waiting for Askia to come in. <laughs> everyone wants Askia to come oh. in because he yeah. is, he'll just lay it down good, man. Yes. But yeah, so so what? as we wait for Askia to come in, what has the reaction to the article been? Um, the reaction, the, the it's been it's been a little of you know both. It's 50 50. No, I would say 60 40. 60, um, 60 positive, 40 negative. And the negativity has just come from like internet trolls, basically. Not necessarily oh, anyone, um, you know being at odds with the words or being uh, uh, pro in word, not, not nothing like that. Just somebody, just people kind of, you know, going out of their way to not respond to the, the article where it's posted, but they would contact me on whatever uh, platform they may see. It. And, you know, they'll say whatever, uh, oh, you know, you think you know it all, or oh, you probably still do it. Uh, you shouldn't be somebody who's saying this and that. You know, those kind of those kind of things. And then the positive was, um, oh, you know, I appreciate you know, like Ricardo, said, I appreciate you taking the effort to be the one to kind of bring this to light. Um, and I always wanted to, you know, kind of say this, but I didn't know how. And, I mean, I got those kind of positive responses and I wasn't looking for them and I didn't expect those either, but I like them. And it kind of- Are you better? I mean, it, it just gives me more, more, more fuel for fire to keep writing and keep, keep, it, keep it positive. Just keep, you know, that's it. Well, I hope you have a few more moments because uh, the man that everyone was demanding to come yeah. on, has uh, showed up. What is going on, Seminole man? Well, am I echoing? <laughs> yeah, you're on. We can hear you. Okay, am I echoing? No, you're good. Oh, okay, okay. Um, now I was just listening. I was just enjoying the conversation. You know, sometimes it's just good to learn. And so, <laughs> oh, go. You know what? I, I'm hearing. I'm hearing a bit of an echo. Hold on, let me see. Let me check my mic. Hold on, let me jump out real quick. Okay. Okay, we'll wait for him to come on. We'll have him for we won't keep you too much longer, Salik, but I thought you'd appreciate the thoughts that a skier would be sharing. So if you can stay on for a few more minutes, I'd appreciate it. All right. Is it by me? As long as you're here. All right, I received that. All right, Askia, what is up? Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, how, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Now, how, how do you pronounce your name, sir? Salik. Salik. Yes, sir. That's what's up. That's what's up. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what's up. Now, I was just enjoying the conversation, man. You know, um, you know, it's it's, I'm, I'm, I'm calling the middle. You know, because I have a, a love hate relationship with that word. You know what I mean? Like, I hate the word, but I find myself using it at times. You know, I'm going to be completely honest. You know, I'm not going to sit here and lie. And, and um, I don't believe it's a term of endearment. You know, I love what Ricardo said is that, you know, that, that word could be paralyzing to some people if you share, you know, when, when you're saying that word, you know, you know, that word doesn't really, um, you know, speak love or, or anything like what we, what we think it, it speaks. But then, you know, I said something very interesting, you know, um, speaking of the last blab, I'm going to make this quick that you all had, I missed the blab, but I kind of was in a room with um, um, Ryan and, um, you know, yeah. he, he, he was a little dejected, you know, somewhat because he, he you know, he, you know, he, he said that um, he was in a blab and I guess he was trying to explain some things about, you know, his ideology as far as how he identifies race and racism. And, um, 
and I was talking to him, you know, I was not, you know, I was like, look, man, you know, I, you know, you, you, you know, I was just trying to talk to him. And then another guy comes on and he, he's a little bit more, you know, kind of like, you know, Salik's, um, um, you know, position statement. I was looking at, he says rough rider, but this dude was like a rough rider. You know, this is one of the dudes on Blab. He's like a legit rough rider, right? So he gets on Blab and he's like, you know, N-word this, N-word this. What do you mean? No such thing as racism, brother. I mean, he's just going at it, right? And so he's trying to explain it. And so when I when I heard him talking, I heard him saying in so many different contexts and a quick story. This this is this is sure why I have a love hate relationship with it. But I I grew up in a really rough area, and um, but I was protected by a lot of people, and I was protected by a lot of people that uh, that most people would overlook. Most people would probably count out. Most people would probably look at it and say, "You're not going to be anyone. You know, you're not going to amount to anything. You're probably going to end up in prison or in jail." Well, those were guys that protected me. Those were guys that looked after me. Those were the guys that saw something in me that they didn't see in themselves. And um, one time, a friend of mine uh, that literally just kept me off the streets, kept me off the train. He was a big dope, dope dealer. You know, I knew what he did, but he he would give me cash and say, you're not going to do this, man. You, you, you're smart, man. You, you know the books, man. You know, keep your mind straight. And so... We kind of I graduated from high school. He kind of he did. He fell into the system, prison. And um, I would do my best to try to keep in contact with him. And and a, a period went where we just lost connect, lost contact. And so I, I go to college, I graduate from college, and I come back home and I run into him. And he looks at me. His name was Israel. I said, Israel, I said, what's up, man? He looks, he's like, man, what's up? And he looks at me and he gives me the biggest hug. I mean, his eyes are bloodshot red. He said, oh, my God, my, and he says the N-word, and he embraces me so hard. I mean, I could, like, my ribs were about to break. And when he said that, Mm. it felt good. You know, it didn't feel like this, an insult. It didn't feel like um, he was calling me something that, you know, this was a guy who sincerely loved me. This was a guy who saw more in me that he didn't see in himself. And as much as I hate that word, and and like I said, I have a love-hate relationship, there is a truth to what I like to call our hood vernacular. And and, and and there's a truth to that. <laughs> I like what that I word. mean is, is that there are there are things that there there are there are words that only a few people know how to say. And everybody's not as articulate. Some people are not as, um, they're not a great wordsmith. And they only know what they know. And they express their truth through the words that in a way means the most to them. And when he said that to me, he was expressing love. He was expressing um, how much he missed me and all these different things. And so with that said, that's why I have such a love-hate relationship with it. I, I, I totally despise the word. I mean, I'm going to be completely honest with you. But I find myself saying it. And I only shared that story because those are the moments where I experience those, those words and those terms and I melt. And, and, and because I know his truth. I know how he articulates. I, I know, you know... Um, you know, I, I forget after he hugged me, he looked at me and he said, I need you to come back home. And no, 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 Dr. Wow. Bob. He looks at me, he says, We just want to touch you. I'm just a regular dude. No, no, listen, wow. I'm just a regular dude to this day. Grew up in the hood, got out, but I was an investment to him. I was an investment to him. You know, this is a guy who literally saw nothing in himself. Exactly. That's it, Ricardo. I was a return on investment. And he wanted to make sure that this guy that he kept out of trouble, this guy that he kept from from Mm -hmm. the streets, he wanted to see me come back. And to him, I was 
probably the biggest investment that he ever made in. And sometimes that drives me to this day. Sometimes I think about him and, and sometimes I wish somebody said to him what he said to me. The things he said to me, his dad didn't say to him. His mom didn't say to him. You know, the older guys that was older than me, older than him, didn't say to him. You know, you know, the, the thing, you know, this this guy was probably one of the this, I mean, people were afraid of this dude. <laughs> but I was like his little brother. So I say all that to say this, man. You know, I was just so enjoying the conversation, man. I was like paralyzed as I was re- as I was listening. That's why I was like, I really want wanted to listen because you know, it's 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 such a um, yeah. Someone has to decide, you know, to uh, stop the cycle, man. And and I think what we have to do is this: we have to find a way. If we want to get rid of words like that, and we want to be, we gotta figure out a way. How do we go into places, those disenfranchised places, those places where these men only know how to speak a certain way? How do we as men? And I'm going to use this word as black men, because the places that I speak of, we know where those, we know who's populates those places. How do we go in those places and how do we help them? How do we how do we read? How do we how do we create a new vernacular or vernacular? How do we create? How do we through love, through transparency, through trust, through authenticity? How do we go into these places? And. And, 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 and create this whole new lexicon. How do we do that? And I don't know the answer to that. But we have to go into these places. And and, and, and Ricardo said it best. You know, look at that guy and say, what's up, black man? You know, what's, when I go out on the basket, I was on the basketball court uh, just the other day. I used to do a little, get a little cardio. And it's this little kid I used to mentor. I haven't seen him in years. He's like 22, 23. Last time I saw him, he might have been about 14, 15. He comes up to me and he gives um, again gives his biggest hug. He's with his homeboy. His homeboy's like, hey man, we need to go. It's time to leave. Let's leave. Let's leave. Let's leave. And he's like, man, I'm catching up with AJ. I haven't seen AJ in years. I'm trying to catch up with him. And he looks and he looks at me and he and he looks at his friend. He said, dude, this was my street uncle. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, what I mean? he's like, this guy used to like sit down and talk to me, help me with my schoolwork. And I was like, you know what? Dang, I did do that. I didn't even remember that. That's the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm this, this, that same instance of how he I made him feel was the exact same way Israel made me feel. Somebody invested it. I invested in him just like Israel invested in me. And when he said that word that I completely hate, I completely despise, I cannot stand that word, I felt more loved than I've ever felt at that instant because I knew where it was coming from. Yeah. Absolutely. I just want to to say in regards to, you know, Ricardo said it's a very personal choice and we have to ask ourselves, especially as black men at one point, you've asked that question to yourself, Askia, you're doing something about it. Salik, you've asked that question to yourself, you're doing something about it. I've asked that question myself many years ago when I picked up a book called Black Men Obsolete, Single and Dangerous. That made me ask questions about myself and taught me that I'm worthy, that I've got to love myself. And the wonderful thing is it doesn't take a whole bunch of us to get it started because I'm a firm believer you don't need everybody, you need the right people. Because as Salik said earlier on, most people are lazy. But if they see something good that's happening, they're going to get out of the laziness to be part of it. And agree. It just takes a few mm-hmm. great souls on platforms like this, whatever. And like saying those things, what's up, black man? Like doing the head nod. Because when I'm out there and I see a young person out there, I don't call, I don't say, hey, hey, N word. No. No. I nod my head. And if whether I get a reaction back or not tells me a lot of what's going on with that person. And- and, and you know, in another way, mm-hmm. to, add, to add to that point, 
is not only as men, but we also have to with, with our beautiful black women. You know, we we you know what we have Absolutely. a tendency, and we sit here and we say, we, I, "I'm pretty sure I know Dr. Vibe. I I know enough of Ricardo, and I'm pretty sure looking at the gentleman uh, above me, Salik, um, that these these seem like men who really revere women and respect women." And I can honestly say, yep. because I yep. was raised by a woman, that there's a word that not one woman can can write about, can can tweet about, Facebook about, and say, I called them this B word. I called them that. I stayed away from that my entire life. Now, but this is the thing. Yep. When these girls hang around each other, what do they call themselves? The same like we say my, my N word, they say, oh, they go my exactly. B. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, it goes across the board. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, the you know, these these negative words that were that that were used to humiliate us, make you feel less than a woman or less than a man, you know, we fool ourselves. And that's the slavery that, that Ricardo was talking about. That's the mental slavery when we somehow fool ourselves into thinking that no, we're gonna take this word, we're gonna own it, and we're gonna make it powerful. That is the f- Stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. How do you find power mm-hmm. in those words? There's no power in those words. And, and you know, yeah, we're, we're trying. We're, we're trying to take those words and say, well, we, well, we're, they're our words now. We own those words. We're going to redefine it. You can't redefine the only thing we. The only the only caveat I see is, is as I mentioned earlier, it is those words are some people's truths. That it that is the only way they know how to articulate. They only know what they know. But look, but that's an exception to the rule. That is an exception to the rule. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. It's not commonplace. Yep. It's the rarity yep. now. Absolutely. Well, Salik, I told you we're staying around. <laughs> <laughs> I know it I mean that's the that's the whole premise of commentate. And, you know, this is why this is where the uh the piece that I wrote started. This is where it's brought me to. And where the point I'm at now is where this point can be the other foundation of to where I can get so we can be in a place, in a position to kind of see a change. And, you know, just like um, a student was saying, it's, 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 it's work, but we, we all have to do, we all gotta, like you said, Dr. Bob, we got to, who wants to put in the work? And as I said earlier, you know, we just have that laziness about us, but at the same time, on the flip side of that coin, we are hard working, and when it is something that we want to see done, we will do it. What we want and what we need to get done to do it, to see it done. So we have to get our attitude wrapped around the the right things. You know, like I I I got a um a, a, a saying, another saying as well. It's um you know what. I can't even think of it right now, but it's basically saying what um, where your priorities are. You know, just putting your priorities. That's what it is. Mm. Priorities over conveniences. Mm. Yeah. So um, once we know and understand what the priorities are and where we want to 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 lay a priority, well, we'll say this is a priority, and that's a priority, and we put them over the, because it's convenient to use the loose language like that. It's convenient for us, like I was saying, when you're at the bus stop talking to the brother, you know, it's convenient to to, to speak loosely with him because you hold a little less, more respect for him than the interviewer that you want to interview with. You're not going to let certain things slip out your tongue as you're talking with him, because you're trying to get that job. You hold low respect for this man. Whether you like or dislike him, you respect him to a certain level. But the person you just left, you might even be, he might be your right-hand man, but you just have 
a little less respect for him. So you uh, lack to Daisy with your conversation and you're, you're not thinking, oh, you know, I could be high as I want because I'm, uh, and we feel comfortable. And I feel comfortable being around my people in the streets, on the blocks, in the hood, you know, but at the same time, when I'm there, I practice, you know, thinking more of what I'm going to say around them and what I want to hear around them. So, you know, when I was growing up, we had a saying, you know, you get the 5% will get around the 85% and they will either act like the 85% or the 85% get around the 5% and start acting like the 5%. Mm -hmm. Behavior. So when you get around folks, you know, the, 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 the one who holds the most power of influence is going to leave with a, the greatest impression on the next one. And so every time I try to, or every time I get into a circle, I strive to be the one to leave that great impression. You know, whether it's, um, and, and those individuals will choose what impression they want, but the impression I'm going to give is going to be positive. So they can take and pick and choose whatever impression they want. It's going to be a positive. It's going not going to, and they have to be like out of their mind to take anything that I give them and find the negativity in it. And be like, ah, uh, no, they just be crazy on their own. So I, I strive to always leave the positive, the vibe there, so like it can just travel on and carry on. It's like I was saying earlier, that energy. I mean, it's the yeah. transference of energy. Folks yeah. don't believe in it because they don't know and understand it enough to think it's real. But they will believe in, in, in the books and the religions that we was given to kind of keep us in place and then downtrodden, you know. And we don't know the next thing, but we just trust in what he told to us, but we don't trust in what... It's, it's, it's energy. It's more than the energy. It's more than just black letters on a white page. It's more than that. So once we get down under all of the circumstances and get to the foundation, to the basis of it all, we, we, like I said, we can't fix the problem till we know the, the base of the problem, where that problem lies at. And then we can, we can start conquering and fixing it. Until then, we don't recognize it. It's just a problem. It's just going to go and get worse. You know, you can put a Band-Aid on all you want. Pull the Band-Aid off, it still won't be a little wow. cut. Mm. Just turn to wow. a but, you know, no. That's where, that's where we... No, and, 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 and we're getting some echoing here, but... Um, whoa, it's getting crazy. No, I just want to say that... Um, in Dr. Vibe Show tradition, you dropped a knowledge bomb with your priorities over convenience. Yeah, that was awesome. That, 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 I, I tweeted that out. That That's that large. Awesome. You know, I, I like to add one more because I know for the sake of time, you know, you said the gentleman's been here longer, but I love something Salik said. I think it can actually be uh, a new blab, Dr. Dr. Vibe. He, he, he's, I'll, I'll get the title. He spoke of um, um, th this, this black... I guess this black um, lexicon we have, as as particularly as black men, where um, we we are we may have been somewhat groomed or or maturated within uh, a, a certain environment, maybe a disenfranchised or underserved environment, where we have adapted a certain type of language as far as how we communicate with our friends and our brothers, and then when we leave and we achieve some level of excellence so for, you know for lack of better words um and yep. we and we have now have to had to ingratiate ourselves with people that look that don't look like us and we now have to make sure we articulate mm -hmm. ourselves a certain way and learn you know how to speak a certain way then what yep. happens is when we go back home when we go to the barbershop we go and sit on the corner with our homeboys. We feel as if if we talk and articulate that way, it is an insult to them. Yes. So we don't, we're not trying to look at them and say, you know, 
you won't understand what I'm saying. You're not intelligent enough to understand what I'm saying. We're trying not to appear as though we're not the same person anymore. You know, I'm still AJ from the block. I'm still Salik from yep. the block. I'm still yep. Fire from the block. You know, I'm still your boy, you know. And so we don't want that look where it's like, dude, who are you? But I love what Salik said. You know, what are we going to do? Are we going to be the 85%, the fire, you know, how do we handle that? And that's a great conversation to have because I don't know that answer. You know what? I'm, I'm, think, I'm thinking about titling it Black Men dot dot dot. What is the price of success? So, but you're not the same. How do we handle that? Yeah, that's that's very true. Great point. Like what Ricardo said, but you're not the same. So how do you handle that? You know? Yeah, you know, the price. But I think it all is, you know, the price of success, you know, does yeah. black men, does success come at a price? And and I'll even say it's not even success. Sometimes it's just exposure. You know? What do you mean? Well, what, mm -hmm. what it means is I grew up in an area where some kids, by the time they were 18, 19, they went past their front doorstep. They haven't seen anything. See, my grandfather used to always tell me when you see more, you'll want more. And when you want more, you'll expect more. So when you get out and you have a young kid, imagine a young kid who's five or six years old in the hood and somebody took that person and showed them things and, and they experienced things. And when they come back, they realize, they look around and say, this is not where I want to stay. I don't want to be here for the exactly. rest of my life. I've seen something greater than this, than this underserved environment that I live in. I've seen something greater than these projects. I've seen something greater than welfare. I've seen... There's an amazing story I shared on Facebook. Ricardo may have seen it. And I don't even want to mess it up. But it talks about this. This, this guy is talking about, he says, when, I, when he was in high school, he went to high school during an era where he was probably one of the few blacks in school. And he had a teacher. The teacher went to him and said, I want you to go to this school across the hill. And it was a really beautiful school, private school. I want you to take this test. And because I feel like you will be, and if you take this test and you pass, this test will allow him to be able to go into these private schools and be able to now get out of these, these more underserved areas and really now begin to experience a more higher level of, of, of academic achievement and exposure and opportunity. So that weekend, he says, Mom, he, he goes and he takes the test. And when he sits down and he takes the test, he looks at it and he says, as soon as he sees the question, he realized he doesn't know any of this stuff. He's not prepared for this stuff. And all of a sudden he gets mad at his teacher as if his teacher set him up. He's like, why would she have me take this test knowing that I don't know this? I don't know these questions. So he does the mm. best that he can and he leaves and his mom comes and he pick the mom comes to pick him up. And, it, and, and he looks at his mom and he's trying not to cry. And his mom and he's like, and his mom asks, what's wrong? He's like, I don't know why she told me to come here. I didn't know any of this stuff. I, I feel like she set me up. And so his mom feels bad for him and they go home. And then the next day he goes, to, he goes to class and he goes to the teacher. And the teacher says, so, so how do you think you did? And he was like, I'm really upset. She said, why are you upset? <laughs> I, I didn't know any of that information. I really felt like mm -hmm. you set me up. Why did you have me go there feeling, feeling, you know, getting all excited, you know, that, you know, that there's this possible opportunity and I get there and I feel like I just fell flat on my face. And she looks at him and she says, look, I can, I have to make sure that everybody in this class, I can only teach everybody to stay at the same speed. Every, I have to make sure everybody in this class is learning at the same speed. I can only do so much. I sent you over there because I needed you to understand that the people here is not your competition, but the people over there are your competition. She saw some, and all of a sudden she, he realized that, wow, she didn't set me up. She saw something in me so great that she wanted me to be able to go there and understand that those are the people I'm going to have to compete with, not the people in this class, but the people over there. 
And he said, and this guy's extremely successful, like a really successful entrepreneur. He's like, that's why I'm so successful to this day. Because she showed me who my competition was. Mm. That's what exposure mm. does. That's what exposure yeah, so does. Th- so how do we frame a conversation around this? The, about black men, the power of exposure? Or the importance of exposure or the effect of exposure? I, I like I like the word important because every time I mentor mentor youth, particularly young men, my goal was always to get them out of their environment, to let them see something okay. that they couldn't ever afford to see. You know, things that they thought okay. they only heard in music, um, seen in videos. You know, some of these kids they aspire for fame and riches and cars and women and all these things because that's what they hear. The only thing about it, most of these kids never heard about a Maybach or Crystal or a Mercedes or this and that unless they heard a Jay-Z record. They never seen it unless they saw a Rick Ross video. That was Their exposure has always come from rappers. So what I wanted to do is say I wanted their exposure to come from an everyday guy like myself who cares about the community and cares about them. If they if we begin to lead them out and allow them to see things and they're not being exposed only to the things they hear in rap music, then we become the influencer and not the rap lyrics and not the rappers. They look to Dr. Vibe and say, I learned about that because Dr. Vibe took the time out of his schedule one weekend, picked me up from my house, and he took me to this place, and he showed me this museum that I've never been to. I'm looking around. I'm seeing all this crazy stuff that I've never seen before. And all of a sudden, now I want to be a scientist. All of a sudden, now I want. I thought I wanted to play baseball. I thought I wanted to play basketball. I thought I wanted to be a rapper. No, I want to be a scientist now. Because Dr. Vibe showed me something that I didn't know existed. Okay. We're going to close off the conversation. We may have an after conversation on that because we've got more topics coming down the the road as always when we do one of our conversations. Um, Salik, I want to say thank you so much, first of all, for writing the article. And... And, uh, you are a family now. Whether you like it or not, you're part of the family like Askia, like Ricardo, like Galen, and others who are here. You're part of the family. Um, any final words and how people can contact you? Um, how they can, well, you can, I'm on Twitter, you know, at Rough Writing. Um, I have a, a uh, blog slash website. Um, it's my first and last name is SalikGruffin.com. Um, you can find a lot of my stuff on um, the Goodman Project. I have the author page on there. Just get on GoodmanProject.com and search my name, and my author page will come up, and there'll be different pieces that I've written, and there'll be more to come down the pipe. And as a skill was saying, uh, well, and you were Dr. Five as well. I thought about um, I, had, I had written I had written a piece before called the um, what is it the oh yeah the bystander effect, and it was basically about how like everybody today where'd you go, Doc? Everybody today pretty much they'll see something happening. And instead of lending a helping hand, they just quick to pick up their phone and record it or take pictures of it. And as a bystander, that effect is, that's what the effect is. You know, instead of lending a helping hand, give some support to the person. They want to record, put it on Facebook, put it on YouTube. And um, that's the wrong exposure. <laughs> so that's why I thought about that, at, because we were talking exposure and how we can tie that into a title for the next blab, some sort of on those lines. Because yeah, that's bad that's exposure. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 
and that bystander effect. I'm, I'm so, I'm so, so tired of seeing somebody post something that they take the whole time to kind of video the whole thing going wrong, but don't do anything. That's wrong. right. That's right. And um, you know, misuse of this technology we got. Man. You know, misuse of the power of the technologies. Like they misuse the power of that N word. Whether or not people want to believe there's power behind it, it's power it is behind very true. Words. Very true. It's, it's yeah, and it's you know what you use that power for. You know, yeah, right and wrong. And everybody got their choice, but it's a thin line between freedom wow. and chaos. Very true. <laughs> yeah, sit man. It was nice. It was nice having you talking with man, you. Man, awesome, man. I, I'm, I'm gonna check out your writings, man. Um, you said um on the Goodman Project. We at GoodmanProject.com. Okay. You know? Um, yep, and just kind of did a search, put in my name and my author page to come up with different pieces. And you say you also have a blog site that is your full name, Salik Ruffin. Yeah, salikruffin.com. It's um it's up, but it's under construction. So there's little stuff that I've taken off, I stripped it down a whole lot. Okay. Stuff okay. There. So salikruffin.com. I like it, man. I like the site, man. As I like the yeah. site. Oh, it, it, it was it was a lot yeah, larger yeah, than that too. Yeah. I'm going through transitions on revamping a whole lot and just giving it a once over. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, where he goes. This, the, yeah, this, this is the first time I've seen Dr. Vibe um, appear not to be able. To, there he is. There he is. He's coming back. There he is. Yeah, there He's he coming is. back. <laughs> Well, he, he had some problems with his connection a little earlier. So mm -hmm. maybe that's what happened just now. So are you in, are you in Toronto as well, Salik? Oh, I'm Washington, D.C. That's what's up. Yeah. I'm in D.C. Why, Dr. Vine in Toronto? I know he's in Canada. Oh, no. Yeah. We're caught over. Yeah, chocolate. Right? Yeah, chocolate city. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, he's in Toronto he too. Come. Okay. Oh, well, he tried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you you're right. Um, you're right, Linda. Um, that is uh. Well, I am weeks. back, and I I'm sure you guys did your final comments, so I will just shut it down but i like to say thanks to everyone who who took part in the conversation i another outstanding conversation salik um makes you out and uh ricardo took care of all the links which is great much appreciated ricardo on that thank you so much so we will all see you soon as always i like to say you're blessed and highly favored you're a magnet for miracles you're a solution for someone's problem you can catch me at the I'll put my website here. All conversations lead to the website. So just make it easy. All my contact information is there if you want to touch base with me. As always, I'd like to say you're blessed and highly favored. You're a magnet for miracles and your solution for someone's problem. God bless. Peace well. Keep the faith. And we will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye. Right. Peace.